Okay, it's already five after nine, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I, I do expect that more people will come. Um, we had some other people that said they were going to come, but they would be a little bit late. So I would like for us to open up with a prayer, and I'm going to ask my husband to do that. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, that we can have this opportunity and privilege to come together as your people and to be prepared for the events that are ahead. You've given us minds to use, and so may we employ them faithfully in your service. So may your presence be with you and bless us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have to give a quick praise report. Um, <clears throat> It was kind of hard to get up this morning, I guess, with, you know, just recovering from the flu and everything. When I woke up, I had all this congestion, and I was coughing again, and I thought, oh, no. And my husband, when I went out into the living room where he was, he's coughing, and he's spitting and sputtering. And so I said, Lord, what am I going to do? I've got to have energy and voice to, to speak today. And he brought to, back to my mind my essential oils. So I got a little pot of water and I put, I think it was just one drop of oregano. Another one may have sneaked in there because it was strong. Four drops of peppermint oil and one drop of Melissa. Melissa's kind of expensive and it doesn't take much. Two drops snuck out on that one. So at any rate, I, I just did a few minutes of steam inhalation with through my breathing through my mouth and breathing through my nose. I couldn't open my eyes because the peppermint was so strong. And I mean, stuff just started pouring out of my head and just you know, spitting the junk up and everything. And my husband, the same thing. He just did a few minutes of that uh, steam inhalation with that and it just really opened things up. So I wanna praise the Lord for his simple treatments. <clears throat> What's that? Melissa. If you don't know, Melissa is also uh, called lemon balm. Lemon balm. And that will grow here like crazy. Okay? If you ever plant it here, you have it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Lemon balm is different from lemongrass? Yes, they are different. Lemongrass looks like a grass. Lemon balm is in the mint family, and the leaves look sort of like a mint. And I'm pretty sure it's in the mint family. But the, the if it I need to check that. I'm pretty sure it's in the mint family, so don't quote me on that. But it, uh, Melissa, or lemon balm, is one of the most powerful antivirals wow. known to man. It's right up there with the usnea that I showed you guys yesterday, which we threw away, so <clears throat> I can't show you the usnea again today. But at any rate, um, my husband and I kind of got a little bit of a ahead of ourselves yesterday because... Um, we weren't sure that we were going to have enough time in the afternoon for the project of making digging sticks. And so, um, yes, yes, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't want to interrupt, no, but that's um, fine. You, you, that usnian that you, we passed around yesterday, how do you do that? Do you make it a tea or? That's a good question. I appreciate you bringing that up. Yes, you can make it into a tea. And one thing that I neglected to mention yesterday, you remember when we were out here, and I'm going to talk about this, I am so grateful I was the only one who got cut yesterday. And it was, it was totally one of those fluke things. I had my, my PTS knife around my waist, or I was getting ready to put it around my waist. I didn't know that the stay had come unsnapped. And whenever I tilted the knife back, it slipped out, and this thing is so sharp, it just sliced my finger. And so, praise God, I was the only one who experienced a cut, but it was a good experience, because here I'm talking to them about safety with blood all over my finger. And so, that was very fitting. Now, what does that have to do with usnea? If I had remembered it, and we don't always remember things in the moment. It's like, you know, when your loved one is hurt, it's like you have to put aside your feelings and go into nurse mode, you know. I could have gotten a handful of that usnea and put it on that, and it would have stopped the bleeding, okay? 
So it, it's very good to stop bleeding. It's very powerful antiviral, antibacterial, and antifungal. It's known as nature's doxycycline. Do you want to see if you can find me a little, that piece of that Usnia quick for those who maybe didn't see it? Um, you can make a tea. Uh, Usnia is not one that you want to use on an ongoing basis because it's very powerful and it can be a little bit harsh on the liver. So it's something that you use like golden seal. You use it when you need it for a week or so and then you take a break for a week or two. Okay, so it's not something you want to use on an ongoing basis. I make tincture out of it. You can make a glyceride out of it, although the glycerin, in my opinion, doesn't extract the medicinal properties as well as an alcohol extraction would. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a teetotaler when it comes to using alcohol other than for the medication issue like that. Is it pure magnesium that I'm sorry, I'm hard of hearing. Usnea, U-S-N-E-A is how you spell it, U-S-N-E-A, this is it here. It always grows in conjunction with this lichen right here, so, uh, or algae, whenever you see those two together. And then I have a video on how to identify this on our YouTube channel, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but, you know, I can barely see it without my glasses, but when you pull the fibers apart, there'll be this little white inner fiber core. So just go watch my video, um, U-S-N-E-A, Usnea is the name of this. That sounds like a, an Asian name, doesn't it? Usnea. But <clears throat> at any rate, um, I don't want to get too sidetracked with herbal stuff. We can do a whole class on that sometime. But um, if I had known about Usnea when I was first diagnosed with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, I would have taken Usnea instead of the doxycycline, which I took for one week and did nothing for me but mess up my gut. So it didn't take care of my Rocky Mountain, okay? So does that answer your question? You can make a tea out of it, like that, that amount that you have in your hand, which is maybe a tablespoon. You could put, you know, a cup and a half, two cups of water and make a tea. It's kind of got a, 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 almost a burnt flavor, something burnt. Um, it's hard to describe that. It's not nasty, but it's, it's not, you know, pleasant either to drink. But you can make a tea. You can make a tincture. I make salve out of it. I have a recipe, and I have a video of how to do this on our channel. Um, I have a recipe of a balm that I call Boo Boo Balm. I kid you not. I have shipped that stuff to, like, four countries, and I have had people right back with so many testimonials on how amazing that stuff is. I put some on my cut this morning and, uh, and wrapped it up. My husband cut himself one time down to the bone, right across the, the thumb joint. You could see the bone in there. And I put that on there and, and pulled it together with, you know, some, a Band-Aid, you know, Steri-Strip type stuff. And in four days, it was completely healed. I mean, to the point that he could do whatever he needed to do. And so it, the Boo Boo Balm has Usnea, it has Comfrey, and it has Yarrow. Those are the three herbs that, that I put in the Boo Boo Balm. You're welcome to make it. I have a video teaching you how to do that on our YouTube channel. I would rather everybody make it than me because I don't have time to make it for everybody. But I do make some up to sell for those who can't or you know, don't have time and need it now or whatever. Okay, <clears throat> again, we're going to get in, uh, into a little bit more information on knives today. Yes. Oh, yeah. He mentioned, let's do the review. For those of you who were here yesterday, don't look at your notes. What are the five, uh, uh, no cheating. What are the five survival priorities? And let's do them in order. Shelter is number one. Okay, I can't hear. We've got a microphone somewhere. What's that? Okay, shelter is number one. Water. Okay, water is number two. What's number three? Health concerns are number three. What's number four? Health concerns. What's number four? Fire. Fire. Good. That was nice and loud. Okay, what's number five? 
No, water's already up there. Food. Food. Excellent. And of course, most of us would reverse this list <laughs> and put food as our number one priority. What, at what temperature can you freeze to death? 60 degrees. That just seems weird, doesn't it? But you, if, if you don't have adequate clothing and proper shelter, you can freeze to death. You die of hypothermia at 60 degrees. So even in the summertime, shelter is number one on our priority list. Okay? All right, we're going to talk about cutting and chopping tools for a little bit now and I'm just going to talk about some of the different tools that we have here and their uses and then my husband is going to talk about the maintenance and care sharpening that kind of stuff of the tools so the the beastie that cut me yesterday is this this is called a PTS and the reason it's called PTS is because it was designed by our friend Jim Buller who wrote the book up here but which we have a few more of these books up here they're twelve dollars we also have some more paracord if you want that for the knot tying class. Jim Buller and my friend Christopher Fisher. Uh, Christopher is a knife maker and he made this knife and he is thankfully in the process of redesigning it and I shall own, by God's grace, if I'm at all able, one of his new ones because it will have um, a stay. And, and what I mean by that, if you look at this knife, you can see there's a little swell here that would prevent your hand from sliding up. Okay, the PTS knife does not have that. That said, and I have a review of this knife on our YouTube channel, it tends to want to pull forward in your hand as you use it, so that's kind of a safety feature. However, I am very keenly aware that this knife is razor sharp all the way up to within a fraction of an inch of my hand. So when I used this, I wasn't planning to use it yesterday, I was just shifting it. And it, the stay had come undone, and the stay uh, is something that Christopher added to the sheath for my, at my request, because I actually fell in our creek one day. Before it had the stay, the knife came out of the sheath and I landed on top of it. Thank God it landed in the creek like this and not like this, because this thing is razor sharp. Now, what is the purpose of this knife? As I mentioned yesterday, I've had a lot of hand surgeries. <clears throat> That's secondary to my autoimmune disease. It caused some problems for me. So I don't have as much hand strength as I did when I was a young woman. So this, to me, is a game changer. I don't have the strength. This is not a cheap machete. This is made by Collins. It's heavy. And you're welcome. I'm not going to pass them around because these are sharp, okay? This is a heavy machete, and if I have to swing this for a while, it's going to wear on my wrist. This is a little too much horsepower for my, my body size. My husband would have no issue with this. This is great for chopping brush, briars, and stuff like that out of the way. But for me, this, the weight between these two is considerably different. They're both, I consider, chopping tools, okay? I don't necessarily consider the PTS a cutting tool, but because it's razor sharp all the way up here, hey, hand me my digging stick. That's fine. Because it is sharp, I actually can do, if you remember when we were making the digging sticks yesterday, I can do some handwork, but it's a little unwieldy, it's a little heavy for me to do that. For, so for more uh, fine type stuff, those of you who got a big knife to work with yesterday, um, you notice the difference when you, when you had one of these small knives and you were trying to make your digging stick as opposed to Sister Amelia had the beefsteak knife. I mean, this, this has got some weight to it, okay? It makes a big difference when you have a little bit of, of a bigger knife. But even with these bigger knives, it's easier for me to do that kind of hand, fine hand stuff with than my PTS knife. I consider the PTS predominantly a chopping knife. These are more for cutting knives. 
okay, what do we need cutting knives for? Like I mentioned, the fine carving stuff, preparing our food that we harvest from the wild or grow out in the garden. We need knives like this that we can cut with. So we don't consider our knives self-defense tools. We consider them survival tools, okay? We're not going to, you know, by God's grace, lose our temper and lay somebody open with one of these things. That's not the purpose. But I'll tell you, ever since I was a kid, I've, I've always been accustomed to carrying a pocket knife. And I have had ladies tell me, why in the world do I need to carry a pocket knife? What would I do with it? And I'm like, how do you live without it? <laughs> so you see, there's a totally different mindset there. I use my knife every single day. I, I have a, 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 it's a clip knife that just clips right on my pocket, and it goes with me even to church on Sabbath. Not because I'm afraid somebody's going to get me, and I'm going to get them back. No. I, you would be surprised and amazed if I told you how many times at church some brother has said, man, I don't have my knife, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> got you covered. You know, at church there have been many occasions where somebody has needed a cutting instrument, okay? So it goes with me everywhere. It may be tucked under my arm, it may be on my skirt belt, but you can just about rest assured that wherever you see me, I'm going to have a knife on me, okay? And, and I use them. Whenever we lived on our farm in Kentucky, this stayed hooked to my skirt or, or my jumper pocket everywhere I went. If I went in town, we lived in an Amish and Mennonite community, and everybody was very practical-minded. And so everywhere I went, all of the stores in the community, this knife was with me. That's before I had the, the folding clip knife. My husband was kind enough to buy that for me. If you excuse me, it's getting toasty up here. <coughs> okay, so let me talk a little bit about who knows what full tang means. Okay, you know what full tang. Okay, what is the tang? Let's, let's just back up a little bit. Uh, where's my PTS? Here. Now, I'm going to leave this in the sheath with the stay fastened, but I'm going to pass it around because you're going to be able to see metal all the way up into the handle on this. We'll start over here and pass it around. This is called full tang. In other words, the metal from the blade carries all the way through the handle. Why would that be important? It makes it less likely to Yes, excellent. And that is the weakness of a folding knife. With a folding knife, you always have this weak point. If it's going to break, it's going to be right here, okay? And with a partial tang knife, you don't have the same kind of strength that you do with that metal going all the way through the handle. So you really, as a general rule, want to look for a knife that is full tang. There are some exceptions to that, and these are they. These are... Uh, Mora Kniv or Mora knives. They're made in Sweden and somehow the Swedes got it right again. Um, these are I think two-thirds or three-quarter tang. I can't remember exactly which but they're not completely full tang. These particular ones. Now Mora does make and I, I didn't bring my other one. I don't know where it's at. Um, I have another Mora that is full tang, and I've ordered another Mora, which if you, if you go to YouTube and look up the, the gray-bearded Green Beret, he has a YouTube channel where he reviews the, I think it's Garberg. Is it the Garberg or Grands, Grands Ball? I think it's the Garberg knife. He says that is the best survival knife. That knife is going to run you at least 80 bucks. It's not a cheap knife, but it's full tang, and it is a very durable knife. It's even these moros right here, which I'll pass these around. You're welcome to pull it out of the sheath, but please be very careful. They are still sharp, even after being beat up yesterday a little bit. I'll just put one this way. <coughs> these are mora knives. I would not at all be afraid to be caught out in the wilderness and the only thing I had was a Mora knife. 
But again, I'm going to try really hard not to be in any situation with only one knife. Because if you lose it, that's it. So like my husband mentioned yesterday, one is none and two is one. Okay, so you want to make sure that you have two knives at a minimum. Now, there are um, different knives for different things. Of course, we have the multi-tool. My husband has this cobalt multi-tool. You guys have seen these. I have, that's my husband's. Mine is a Leatherman Wave, if you're familiar. These are over $100 now. But it, they're very handy. They have, um, it's, it's called a multi-tool for a reason. They have pliers. They have wire cutters here. They have all kind of blades that will fold out and stuff. I'm happy to pass this around, but please, again, be careful. These blades are very sharp. We'll pass the cobalt this way and the leatherman this way. So you can see it's unsnapped there. The cobalt's pretty used, so it might yeah, the cobalt has been around the block a time or two. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the differences of blades. Now, I am not a metallurgist, I guess is how you say it. I'm not an expert on knife metals by any means, but I just want to bring out two, um, two main points here. If you will notice, let's see, let me just use this one. I'll snap that back. This is another one that's very similar to the uh, Mora knife or the Mora Kniv. This is actually a Baco. It's kind of a light not duty knife. You might use this more for the kitchen. It's made very much like the Mora knives, and all of these were heavily used yesterday and not cleaned up. So they're, they're dirty and they need to be cleaned up and resharpened and stuff. But um, at any rate, you'll notice this has a silver blade. This is stainless steel. Stainless steel will hold an edge better, but it's much more difficult to sharpen, okay? It's not gonna, it's not gonna get dull as fast, but when you need to sharpen it, you're gonna spend a little bit more effort, okay? That's a stainless steel blade. These blades are carbon. Now, carbon is much easier. You can see it's got a coating on it. Carbon is much easier to sharpen, but it's not going to hold an edge as long as a stainless steel blade, okay? Each has their place. And one of the things I don't like about the Mora knives that are going around is they don't have a 90 degree angle on the spine, on the back of the spine for striking a ferro rod, and you'll see why that's important a little bit later. You can fix that. You can grind a 90 degree on it, um, but they don't have it right away. My PTS has it, wherever the, that is. The PTS you can strike a, um, a ferro rod with, and I think this one has it. Yeah, this one you can even use the butt end of the knife here, the handle. You can strike a ferro rod with this, and, or you could put a lanyard through it. But this has a 90 degree, and you can strike a ferro rod, but this knife also comes with, and I showed this yesterday, it comes with a magnesium, and ferro rod. Um, then we'll, we'll talk about that whenever we go into the fire starting class. All right, now I'm going to move away from knives a little bit to um, let's talk about axes. <clears throat> All right, we have basically three grades of axes up here. Most axes that you're going to find in a regular hardware store. Is it just me or is it really hot in here? It must just be me, yeah. Okay, this is, I think, a marbles axe. Let me look, I'm pretty sure in this a marbles. Yeah, this is a marbles axe. And you always wanna keep the sheath or the mask on your axe when you're not using it. Honestly, I'll be quite frank with you. I consider this a, a junk axe. I think we paid about $30 for it, $25, $30. Um, you're welcome to look at it. If you look at the wood grain on the handle, the wood grain is not too bad. All of your wood grain should be parallel like this. And where it's mounted, if you look at this ax, it's, it's kind of a funky job. If you look at the way that it's mounted, you'll see. But even the shape of the blade, 
you want the top of your blade to come up a little and the bottom down a little. This to me doesn't really come down enough and it's a very weird shape that would take quite a bit of sharpening to, to make this into a good decent axe. It's a decent ha hatchet, it's more of a hatchet. Okay, these are hatchets. This is actually a small forest axe. Where's the other axes? Oh, okay, here. This is more of a small forest axe. And I'll talk more about these in just a minute. This is actually considered a boy's axe. My husband, when he really wants to get under my skin, he calls us at my hatchet. Where's your hatchet? I'm like, <laughs> it's a boy's axe or a woman's axe. And I really like this. This is an S-wing. Um, it's not a splitting axe. You're not going to split much wood. If you notice, that blade is very long and narrow. This is great for chopping, for chopping or bucking wood, cutting wood into pieces, cutting down a tree. But if you're going to split a log, you're going to get this stuck because it's so narrow that it's going gonna, it's gonna to bury deeply into the wood and you're, you're going to get it stuck. Okay, so use your tools for what they're intended for. Again, this has not been cleaned up and, and taken care of like it needs to. Now, this is a perfect example of how not to use an axe. If you notice, the wood here is really beat up. That's because somebody had poor aim and I may have been part of that. I don't know. I don't even remember where this axe came from. I I've had it for many years. But if you look at the back of the axe, you can see that this axe has been hit with something metal. Okay? You never want to use an axe as a wedge. Okay? You never want to hit the back of an axe with a sledgehammer or any other kind of hammer. Okay? because you can actually really damage this. And this axe is severely damaged. It, it, it's still safe to use, but it's, it needs some cleanup and repair. Uh, it is fairly sharp, but this is more of an axe that I would use to cut out root stumps or something like that with. Okay, this is not one that I would really consider a good quality axe. Now, why? Who knows why there's two heads, two bits on um, a double-bitted axe? Does anybody know why you have these two bits? Okay. I wondered that for many years. And I finally learned a few years ago, and I thought, that is so smart. These were used a lot by firemen and, and the, the jump crew and all that. They have actually one that's called a Pulaski that's shaped a little bit different. But they also use these double-bitted axes, and they keep one bit very sharp for cutting and chopping down trees, and the other bit is used for chopping roots and things like that. So one side you keep out of the dirt, the other side, you're, you're okay. You can chop out roots and stuff like that. Sandpaper is called sandpaper for a reason. So whenever you are using these cutting instruments, you want to try to keep it out of the dirt. Yesterday, um, I looked up, and, and one of our knives was sticking in the ground like this. And I, I, I took a deep breath and said, okay, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> and I just asked the person, could you please not put it in the ground? Because Whenever your blades come in contact with the dirt, it's going to have a dulling effect, okay? So you want to try to keep your blades out of the dirt. <clears throat> All right, let me go back to these little hatchets and small axes. This is a Fisker's. This is my husband's, and he really likes this thing, and it works well. And I like the fact that it has this big swell down here for the hand, because again, I don't have the hand strength that I used to have. It's fairly balanced, and I can, I can use this fairly well. This, I think, was about $60, something like that. Anyway, um, I, I don't particularly care for the, the uh, mask on this thing because it's kind of bulky plastic, and I can never get it in there to go, go in there to the first try. But at any rate, that's a pretty nice little, little hatchet camp axe type thing, okay? So I would call this my least favorite, 
And this is kind of my middle favorite. Do y'all want me to pass these around? Do you want to see these? Okay, we'll go this way with this one, and we'll go this way with this one, and y'all can just switch sides. You're welcome to take the mask off of those two. They're not all that sharp, but just be careful. This is a horse of a different color. This is called a Grand Force Brook Small Forest Axe. Anybody want to wager a guess as to how much this axe costs? You're pretty close. $178. Okay? This is not a toy. It is razor sharp. And let me ask you a question. This again is a Scandinavian axe. Those people know their cutting and chopping tools. It's razor sharp, so if this passes around, please don't take the mask off because it, it is razor sharp. It has a nice swell. The, the, the wood grain is, is parallel, which makes it stronger. The axe head comes down on the handle, which also gives you more strength. Now, where's that piece of wood for batoning? We forgot our piece of wood. I don't know where it's at. We had a piece for batoning. Batoning is something that you can do with a heavier knife, preferably full tang, although you can do it with these Mora knives. <clears throat> but if you find that you need a little bit more horsepower and you get your, you've gotten your axe or hatchet stuck, you don't want to hit it with another piece of metal, but you can hit it with a piece of wood. You can get a piece of wood and you can bang that. You're not going to hurt this metal. And that's, that's a way that, that you can get around that. If, if my life depended on it and all I was going to have was one chopping tool and one cutting tool, for me personally, it would be a struggle to choose between these two for my chopping tool. Okay? This is going to give you more versatility and more horsepower, but it is a little bit heavier. This I can lash around my waist. Of course, this could be placed in some sort of you know, belt holster as well. This can be carried on the waist or in a backpack or what have you. I would have a hard time choosing between my PTS and this Grand Force book. I'm going to pass the Grand Force book around, but please do not remove the mask. It is very sharp. Okay, but you can see the weight of it, the balance of it. That, you can tell, is a very different, um, very different animal when it comes to, um, to an axe. And here, again, we could use, I could use this um, stick to baton or to bang through. Like if I wanted to use this knife, I could put it on a piece of wood and just bang it right through. And you can split small pieces of of uh, firewood and the like. And my husband brought me just uh, to show, these are his wedges for felling trees with the chainsaw. You can use these with batoning, but you can also make wood wedges by just taking a, a little round piece of wood like this and you, you just would, like we were making the digging sticks yesterday, you would just bring it to, the, to a wedge shape. And these can be very effective wedges for splitting wood. You would just start a split on the end of your wood with your camp axe or your knife or what have you, and then you would put the wedge in there and baton it in with another stick of wood. So you can actually make wedges out of wood. <clears throat> okay, let's talk a, just a minute about some other cutting tools. If I'm going to be either in a survival situation or a homestead situation where I can't go buy any other tool, I'm going to want a cutting tool, a chopping tool, and some kind of saw. Okay? Now, there's a big difference between these two, but there's also a big difference in portability. This little um, saw right here, again, it's a Swedish made, I think Scandinavian made, spin saw. It's what? Out of Minnesota. Yeah, but it's a, it's a Swedish design, I think. Sven saw they designed these. It's aluminum, and that blade is razor sharp. It's amazing how sharp this little thing is. 
It, and you can really go through quite a bit of, of wood with one of these. And it weighs almost nothing, okay? It's a good idea to get like a little piece of rubber hose to protect your blades with. So that's something to consider so to protect the blade. He's going to show how it breaks down. And while he's disassembling and putting that back together, how many of you have used one of these bow saws? A good many of you. You can really cut a lot of wood. I like this one because I'm short, and if I need to cut a limb, that you know, I could, if I needed to, I could cut this light down. <laughs> I won't do that. But I, could, I, I have a lot of reach with this and I can cut through a bigger piece of wood. I can reach through branches and get that one over there that's holding things up or whatever. And we actually just bought some replacement blades for these. And I just encourage you, if you don't have a bow saw like this, this is a very good tool to have because you can really go through some firewood. You can cut a lot of wood with one of these. And if your blade is sharp, it's not going to, to take too much effort. And you see how easily that folds down. Now, I'm just going to pass it around so that you can see the weight of it. That one you, you can come up and look at. But you can see how lightweight that is. Um, one other thing that I want to talk about, and then I'm going to let my husband talk about um, what he wants to share. <clears throat> if you go look at my video on the PTS, and you can do this with other knives be besides the PTS. Now, I would wear gloves if I was doing this. And I show this on our video. But Sister Lois figured out this technique yesterday, and I thought, that is so neat. Necessity is the mother of invention. Have you ever done that before? Not, not really. She, she put her digging stick, she was kneeling on the ground. She put the pointed end on the ground so that it was stable. She put the other end in her belly and kind of leaned into it to hold it. She made a vise out of her body. And then she took her blade and was using it as a draw knife to take the bark off of her stick. And that is a very excellent technique and way to use these because you, you have a lot of control over it. You're not going to cut your guts out. And so it's, it's very good to to use as a technique that way. You can also push with it, but it's much easier to pull with it. That's, so that's a very good technique to use. Now, yesterday, before we started our, our um, digging stick project, we talked about the blood bubble. And whenever you do like this with your knife, anything that is within that range is in your blood bubble. Stay back, because if whoever's using that knife slips, and you're within that blood bubble, ouch. And it might be more than ouch, okay? So just be aware of who's in your blood bubble, okay? I think we covered enough on this for now that I'm going to hand it over and let my husband, yes? Do you recommend suppliers? Like, who would be your best suppliers for tools? For tools? Um, well, let me go with brands, because there's different suppliers for these things. Grands Force Brooks. Now let me let me qualify this. Some of these tools are expensive. The the Grands Force Brooks is a very expensive small axe. But if that's all the cutting tool I'm going to have, I want one that I can depend on. I want one that's not going to break. The handle is more durable. The the axe head is going to be easier to maintain. It's sharper. It's designed for what I need to do. It's not just designed for somebody to make money off of. Okay, I'm going to invest my money in the best tool that I can afford. And the Lord provided for us that we were able to get these, this Grands Force Brooks. I highly recommend it. Omaha Tool. Omaha Tool. I think it's Omaha Tool or Omaha Knife Works or something like that. Is it Omaha Tool? I'm pretty sure it's Omaha Tool. They carry the Grands Force Brook, and it, I believe it's 178 postpaid to U.S. addresses for the Grands Force Brook's small forest axe. That's what that's called, a small forest axe. Okay, for more knives, you can find those just about anywhere. Just type in M-O-R-A, Mora Knife. If you want, 
Um, as I mentioned, Christopher is redesigning this. When he makes the new generation, it's going to have a finger stay right here. And if I am at all able, I shall own one of those. I paid $70 for the knife and the sheath, the plus shipping. I think the, I think the knife was 35 and the sheath was 35 Okay, With the new generation, there's going to be a little more work and a little bit more metal. Um, so he may charge more. I don't know. But this, this is a very good setup. Yes, ma'am. This is a BK something, something, something. And I also got this knife from Christopher. He didn't make it, but he sold it, sells it. BK 15. B and K, this is a K-bar knife, if you've heard of K-bar. It's actually a pretty good knife. Now, I actually prefer stainless steel blades to carbon steel blades, um, but I have to admit, this is a pretty good knife. So, anyway, it's a K bar. B and K 15, K bar. What's that? It has a fire starter in this little pouch here that I showed. We'll talk about this more whenever we talk about the, the, the fire starting which I'm taking way too much time so because we, we've got a lot to cover today. Yes. Does Christopher have a website? Christopher has a web website, C.T. Fisher Knives, and the Fisher is F-I-S-C-H or F-I, I'll send it to you, F-I-C-H-E-R, C-T, F-I-C-H-E-R, Knives. Okay, i got to spell it and look at it. I have dyslexia, y'all, so... Write it up here so they can see it. C.T. Fisher Knives. C.T. Fisher Knives. Now, if you want to buy other knives, Christopher makes all kind of knives, but they are expensive. They're very expensive. The only knife that I have bought from him that he made was the PTS knife and the sheath for that. Yes, sir? I read lips. I'm very hard of hearing in your mask. So can you tell me? Christopher's located in Idaho, in Idaho. I'm so sorry, but with these masks, um, I read lips a lot, and I just, I'm, I'm deaf without. So. Okay, ctfisherknives.com is, is Christopher's webpage, ctfisherknives.com. He makes really good stuff. I mean, it's high quality stuff, but it's kind of expensive. Um, but again, if your life is going to depend on it, you want something that your life can depend on. Okay, if if I'm going to have to provide, you know, for my family, I want the best tools that I can afford at the time. Okay, are there any questions on that part? Yes, sir. What about knife sharpeners? Next. <laughs> Lead into the next section. Yeah, that was perfect. You couldn't ask for better. I just want to put a plug in for my wife in her boo-boo bomb. I get lots of boo-boos, and it really works. I'm thankful for it. Um, we want to look a little bit about if we're going to invest in knives and tools we need to know how to care for them. And as yesterday, some of you learned, it was on a, a short notice, but as we were out there using the knives, we had to do a, a, a informal introduction to some of the safety um, requirements when using a knife. Now, my wife covered one that I'm gonna repeat because it is very important, and that is the blood bubble. Always try to make sure that you keep that distance because anything can happen. And you've got to be observant of what's around you because yesterday had a lot of little ones running around. And so another thing too is if you're not using this, where should it be? In the sheath. In the sheath, yes. Put it away. Put it away. 
Oh, yeah, my wife was mentioning, don't, don't cut over your legs. Um, something I do do. And I wanted to confess, too, a couple things. I'm responsible for this. I, di <laughs> I didn't have a splitting mall at the time. And one more thing, I just, this plays on my conscience. It might seem nothing to you, but we talked about my walking stick yesterday, and we said that we killed a couple copperheads. I've killed several copperheads, but I said I killed two with this. It was only one. But anyway. I thought you didn't have a three. I guess you No. Answer. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm just going to go through some safety um, things to keep in mind with knives and axes. And um, before I do, I want to ask you to share with me. Some of you used knives, maybe, in the past for the first time yesterday. Maybe you use them for years. I think these ladies are pretty handy with them. But name some good safety um, instructions when handling a knife and an ax. Let's name some before I do. Yes. Don't take it out of the sheath until you're ready to use it. Very good. Another one. Keep it sharp. That is one of the most important ones there, is to keep your knife sharp. Why would you think that is so important to keep your knife sharp? Yes. It's easier to handle. You don't have to put a flat, a lot of force. Very good, because that comes into play with that blood bubble. If you're putting a lot of force on it to get it through, it's going to slip out, and you're going to end up way out here. Yeah. Okay. Why else would you want to keep it sharp? You talked about it a little bit. What? Oh, yes. You want to keep it sharp because if you have a dull knife, if you get cut, it's not going to be a clean cut. That's a very good point. Did everybody hear that? Yes. There's a difference when you have a sharp knife and get a cut and a dull knife. A dull knife is going to have burrs. It's going to tear more. Um, and you talked about, I think that you were talking about, brother, is it's going to take more energy to use a dull knife. And we often have a tendency to try to take off more than we really need to. You need to take just even strokes, just a little at a time. OK, some other safety instructions that would be good. Well, Go ahead. Very good. Cut away from the body. It's also good to, um, let's just use this. It's always nice to have an, it's, well, we had a tree stump. Something solid to work on. So you're, what you're working on isn't moving around either, because that makes it harder, more unwieldy. But have something solid to work on when you're working with it. Brother? Okay. Um, I'm going to use it if somebody would like to. We'd like to make sure we get all of this heard on recording too. Yes. Keep keep your hands onto your knife because if you got it sticking out here and you're cutting and it would hit something, well then your fingers right underneath that blade. Okay. Any other things? That's a good point. You know, tools, you wouldn't use a screwdriver to cut a board. I mean, that's pretty obvious. But even a knife and hatchets, there are different jobs for different size knives or different knives and hatchets and axes. And you have to know uh, the jobs that they're good for. Um, and we, my wife mentioned some of them. Now, for example, if we're going to baton. Now, I would not baton with this knife. <laughs> that knife is not meant. If I got a baton with this knife, I, I've got the wrong knife. 
But so you want to use the right knife, the right tool for what you're doing. But we want to make sure that we keep these out of the reach of children too when we're storing them. You, some people keep them locked up or up higher. Um, but keep them knife we t or sharp, we talked about that. Um, let's see what else we have here. Oh yes, the knife, always grab and hold it by the handle. Okay, and when you hand it to somebody, yeah, yeah turn it around this way. And don't hand it to them holding it this way. Bad idea. Bad idea. Um, seen people check the sharpness of a knife this way. Bad idea. You're going to cut yourself. You can feel it this way. Okay. Um, and there is a right way and a wrong way in, in the, to put your knife in the sheath. And I saw this several times yesterday. <laughs> but you can see the shape of your sheath. Make sure that your knife shape goes in the same way. And you'll hear it usually click. Um, because if you put it in backwards, then your knife is going to be, edge is going to be hitting the sheath and it's going to dull it. Um, and something I like to do, if I'm going to be sharpening, which I'm going to talk about that, I like to wear a pair of leather gloves. Because your fingers are very close to the blade. And so a pair of leather gloves, good to have. And don't be in a hurry when you're using a knife. Uh, that's when accidents happen. Um, and try to make sure that you're using your dominant hand. Sometimes you've got a switch. I don't know, maybe you can use two hands. I can't. I'm very unambidextrous with my left hand. Um, and if you should happen to drop your knife while you're using it, should you try to catch it? Let it fall. No, let it fall. That's right. And something, too, even, you know, you've seen this in the movies, at least I did. Um, you see these lumberjacks walking through the forest, whistling on their way to work. Yeah, don't carry your axe like this. Why wouldn't you do that? That's right. It's right near your head. Just think, too, if a branch caught it and this come up to catch you. Always now a double-bitted axe is going to be different than a single, but always carry it down by your side. And what should you do if you happen to trip? Because when you're in the woods, I don't know, there's a lot of stumps, roots that you just don't see. You're going to end up be tripping. What should you do? You throw it. If you're stumbling, you throw it to the side of you. Don't try to hold on to it. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, yeah, don't use if you're tired either, because that's when accidents happen. Um, and then think of safety. Like I said, the leather gloves. It depends on the task that you're doing, but safety glasses. And a good pair of shoes, especially if you're using an ax. Um, I don't have steel toed, but it probably would be recommended if you're doing a lot of chopping, um, especially felling trees. Um, good idea to have safety shoes. Um, and that's it that I have for safety, but we want to look at maintenance now. We invest a lot of money into our tools, and so we want to care for them. And uh, so they should be cleaned, and I'm a bad example, but they should be cleaned after every use. And like, for example, this knife here. These were all used yesterday, so they're all dirty. But this knife here, well, there was one that was a little dirtier. Let me get that one out. Yeah, you can see this knife got, I'm not sure what that is on it. Hard to know when you're cutting bark. There's things on bark you don't know. But how would you clean this knife? Now, it depends what it is, but by the looks of it here, just simply soap and water. You don't want anything real abrasive. But soap and water would be fine. Same thing you could do for your handle. Um, now, I brought one of my dad's um, skinning knives, for an example. I used to hunt, but I don't anymore. But this is one of his. It hasn't been used for a while. It's been setting in the sheath for quite a while. But you can see that there's rust on here. It's just on the edges here. 
and just a little bit on the tip, you can see. What would you do for rust on a knife? Pardon? If it's just on the edge here, where typically you're going to find that with a stainless steel knife, you could get by with just sharpening it. Uh, but sometimes it'll come back a little bit further. So what would you do if that rust was a little bit further back? You couldn't take it off with sharpening. I know ladies probably know this. Yes. You can use a mild abrasive um, baking soda, um, but something even milder and just the tip if you soak it in or whatever's rusty. Uh, my wife does this with cast iron um, cookware, but vinegar, you can use vinegar. Um, but even with this, I just looked at this knife, I tried cleaning it off. This is really just surface rust here. I can take this off simply with soap and water on this as well. Um, but it depends how deep it is. You may have to use something more aggressive to get the rust out. It just depends how deep the rust is. And then I just, as far as um, the knife itself too, you can um, and should actually um, oil your, your blade um, to avoid the rust. And so you can use a three-in-one oil, um, you can use a gun oil, uh, sewing machine oil. You don't want to use car oil because car oil has detergents, additives, cleaners, and different things which can affect the blade on your knife. Um, another thing too is, my wife mentioned this, have a designated tool this one here I do use and have used for stumps in the yard. Um, and because it takes a little work if you mess up the bits, the edges on these. And that's where I want to go to next. Um, what we talked about, one of the greatest uh, safety issues and maintenance issues really is keeping your edges sharp. And so how do you do that? Well, when I was young, I grew up using whetstones, and so that's what I'm familiar with, and so that's what I stay with. Um, but the whetstones that they have today are not the whetstones that I used to use. These are really uh, fancy. The whetstones that I had, they were just a block. You've probably seen them a coarse side and a medium side, or a fine side, a medium side. And then the one that I liked the most when I did uh, axes with the pucks, have you ever seen the stone pucks? Those I like them the best, but you know what? I've looked several places, I can't find them. I've got them, but we've moved 13 times in the last nine years, and I can't find everything that I used to have. But anyway, um, I recommend a puck for the axes, as long as I got this. Um, because with an axe, you're going to do heavier work than you will with a knife. And a lot of times when you're using an axe, you're heading toward the ground with it. So chances are you're going to end up in the ground sometime or another. You're probably going to hit a rock if you're using this, which I do to take out stumps and taking out roots. And so you're going to need something more than a whetstone. I want to talk more about this, but as long as I got this axe in my hand, um, you're going to want to use a file. Um, because when you get a divot, now I don't have any divots in this, but this file, when you get a, a nick in the edge, you're going to have to take metal off. It's not going to be just sharpening it. You're going to have to remove it. Because you can look down, when you sharpen now, you can look down your, your edge. And what I like to do is just kind of eyeball it. Because you want to stay with the angle that your axe or knife has. Now, most your knives are going to be between 15 and 25 degrees. Now, if you do it enough, you can just kind of estimate, or like I said, just look at it. You can eyeball it. It's close enough because when you think about it, this is a, a knife sharpener. I can sharpen an axe with this too. Now, this is a steel sharpener. My wife and I have used a lot of sharpeners. Now, this one we really are impressed with. It puts on a nice edge. I am surprised. 
But this is a three in one. This side I can do axes and knives with. This side I can do um, loppers, you know, that you're cutting out branches with. And then there's a, a little groove right here you can do scissors with. And we're both really impressed how well this really works. Um, but my point, what I wanted to say with this is when you use these or any of these sharpeners, I've got another one here. This is carbide with ceramic. The carbide is more coarse. It's going to take out the rougher edges. The ceramic is for the fine. But whenever you use something like this, it has a fixed angle on it. So it doesn't matter what angle this is or any of your knives are. This is the angle you're going to end up with. So that's why I'm saying, really, you can just eyeball it when, you, when you're using the uh, whetstone or the file. But just really just following it along. But you want to have a, a secure, as I was talking before, a secure place to work. I mean, if you're going to hold it, this is going to move. I like to put it in a vise because then there's no movement on it. But you just follow it with the file, and you're just going to move along. And I, I like to keep track of the number of strokes that I do because I like to keep it the same on the other side. Now I've got an axe here I wanted to show you that I had sharpened last time and I'll show you what happened. Now depending on the angle of your, your axe or your knife, this is how it should look. You know, it might be, the angle might be different, but I looked at this uh, Estwing boy's axe, and the, uh, let's see, how was the edge on it? It was more like, like this. I over sharpened it on this side. You can see that? You don't want that. Um, so I'm going to have to bring this edge back. I'm going to have to file it this way. It should come, the, the peak sh point should be in the middle. And so if you have nicks or burrs, you can start with a file. Um, but typically with most knives, if you do your maintenance, now this one comes with a nice little angle that you can set. So you can set your knife on there and you can follow that along. But again, I've seen other things, for example, like I said, anywhere between 15 and 25 degrees. If you're not really sure what 20 degrees is, if you want to be somewhere in the middle, you can get a piece of paper. That's a 90 degree angle. You fold it in half, and what do you have? 45. You fold it in half again, what do you have? 22 and a half. So you can lay that up there. That'll get you close, OK? Um, but if you're doing regular maintenance, on your knives. Um, now this, this here is a wet stone. Now this is considered a splash stone. Do you know what, well there's, I'll just tell you, there's a splash stone and a soak stone. Do you know what the difference is between a splash stone and a soak stone? A soak stone, depending on the grit, is going to have to be soaked for an X number of minutes. Each manufacturer I found to be different. The finer it is, it might be around five minutes. The coarser it is, they can soak it up to 20 minutes. But I like using a splash stone. That's what I grew up with. I have a bucket of water next to me. I'll dunk my stone in there, and then I'll just start going. And I'll show you how to do that. But as I was saying, if you do regular maintenance, now this has a coarse, medium, and fine. The coarse now, again, is going to be more for something serious, not your usual sharpening. It's probably going to be a big burrs or nicks to use the coarse. You won't use that very often unless you've really abused your knife. But I'll typically start with the medium. And uh, I can pass this around, but I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. But again, I'll dunk this in water just to get it wet. And the reason for that is because this is a stone. There's grit on it. If you're using it, the pores will fill up and it won't do its job. Okay, so what you want to do, or what I do, get, get the stone wet, and I'll start down here, and I'll get my angle. I kind of know the angle that I need, and I'll pull it towards me, and I'll move it this way as well, and you've got to follow it all the way to the tip, to the end. Now, I'll count my strokes again because I want to keep them even. I'll do five, 
and then I'll go back this way, the same thing, pushing down and pulling out all the way down. I'll do that five times. I'll rinse my stone, rinse my knife, and I'll check it. And if it's where I want it to be, um, I'll move on to the fine. The fine's going to put on a nice, sharp edge. Same technique, just draw it towards you, following it all the way down to the, through the tip. Count the number of times, because I didn't do that. That's why I ended up with one side at a sharper angle than the other. Um, and just keep rinsing the stone. We want to keep the grit out of there. I rinse my knife as well because that stuff can build up on your knife as well. Um, that's basically it, I guess. Um, yeah, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say one thing. <clears throat> Get close to the microphone there. You know, ladies, we've got a lot of stuff going on. You know, we, we have to multitask, we're cooking, we're answering the phone, we're dealing with children, we're, you know, all kind of stuff. This is idiot proof. And I'm not at all saying that ladies are idiots by any means, but I'm saying for myself, I have never mastered really, I mean, I can sharpen a knife on a wet stone, but I don't mess up with this. If, if you really just, don't want to be a master knife sharpener, you just want to keep your knife sharp, get one of these. It's made by Steel, S-T-I-H-L, I think that's how you spell it, Steel Chainsaws. This one is, this particular one is made by Steel. I like this one because it protects your hand as you draw your knife through to sharpen it. I like these because they're a little more portable and they do have the ceramic, which you're going to get a, a better edge by using the steel and then the, the ceramic. So for me, as a woman, I'm going to stick with these. So anyway, what, did you have your hand up? I was going to ask the brand. You said it's steel. Steel, steel like the steel chainsaw, chainsaw brand? Yeah. Now, this is somewhere around $25. And this setup, this was 15 Oh, OK, $15. This was $25. I got this at Walmart. Um, it's got an, and these, yeah, I've seen these as $4. They're not, not much to them. But um, this, I haven't used this. I just bought it because I couldn't find my whetstones, so I can't honestly tell you how well it is. But I set it down on a platform, and it's got four little legs on here. They're really sticky. It holds it well in place, so you could simply use it right on this. Yes. What is the difference? Is it okay to use oil on a whetstone? I've seen that before. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is. They call this honing oil. You can use oil. It's just like when I started in carpentry work. You know, I would ask 10 different people the same question, and I would get 10 different answers. It just depends what you're comfortable with. Um, so some people wouldn't use anything but oil because oil will lighten the friction. That's what oil does. But water well, dissipates the heat is what they say. I don't know. I, I just can't imagine that I'm sharpening my knife enough where I'm going to create that much heat. Um, but there are probably other reasons um, why they use oil. I don't know. Um, but I've heard some people say you don't need to use oil. I've never used it. It may be better. I don't really know. Yeah, I don't know if I mentioned it, but when you're done with your knife, you should oil it. And you can use, um, like I said, three-in-one gun oil, sewing oil, and leave it on. Don't wipe it off. Leave it on. Leave it set out on a piece of cardboard and let it set to dry for about an hour or two until it's dry. Then you could put it back in your sheath. Um, anyway, yeah, you can use oil. All right, we're going to move to what we're going to do, knot tying. And uh, yesterday I mentioned, or <laughs> yesterday I mentioned, I, I <laughs> my wife wanted to tell on me, but this was the rope. Yesterday I mentioned, I told you that I, I didn't tie, know how to tie knots before, and so we pulled a car out of the ditch. And this was the knot, this was the rope I was telling you about. I still can't get that untied, so we cut it off. <laughs> 
But now I know better, and we're going to teach you some of those knots. Why do we need to worry about learning how to tie knots? Really? What was that? I don't know. You don't know. Let me just share with you a personal experience that I had. <clears throat> you know, my husband jokes about, you know, his, his knot here. And it worked. He was able to, to do the job. He was able to get the person out of the ditch. We had, on the farm where we lived, um, that we, we talked about where we sold, we had been set up off-grid and everything. We divided land with some friends of ours. Don Miller was one and then another couple. <clears throat> and they decided to build their house way up on the ridge. And the driveway was very steep. And off to the edge of the driveway was a very sharp drop off. And the driveway was north facing, which if you don't know, that's not really the best situation if you live where you get a lot of snow and ice. It was winter time, and my husband had gone outside for something. I was in the house, I didn't hear it. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, he heard <laughs> and then beep, 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 beep. And he ran in the house and he said, Debbie's hung up on the hill. Her vehicle would not make it up the hill, and she was stuck on the side of that hill. So we jumped in our Jeep, we grabbed some ropes and stuff we had in the, in the house, we threw them in the Jeep, and we went over there, and we ran up the hill, and here's Debbie in an absolute panic, just weeping. She was so nervous. They had borrowed this van because their vehicle had broken, and here she's stuck and sliding backwards with the back end of the vehicle heading towards that embankment. And it would not have been a pretty sight if she would have gone over the edge. She was very upset. So my husband ran on up the hill to get her husband, and I ran down the hill and got some of our ropes. I tied a bowline to the front of the truck, and I found a tree up off at an angle that would keep her on the driveway. And I went around the tree, and I tied a trucker's hitch and tied her off so that she would not slip over in the ditch. That alone was enough that she calmed down. We prayed together, and then her husband got there, who was uh, kind of a little bit of a renegade, and he untied the knot and just fast backed the car all the way down the hill and then came barreling up, hit the ditch on the way up, tore up the fender, but he made it up the hill. So, you know, I guess everybody has their own way of doing things, but that taught me a very valuable lesson about the importance of learning how to tie a knot and learning it well so that under pressure in an emergency, I can tie some of these knots without even looking. Because we're driving down the road, my husband and I are driving down the road talking and I'm tying knots. I'm tying the doors together. I'm tying my fingers together. I'm tying the gear shift to the door. You know, I'm practicing these things because I know I need to have it so ingrained that it's automatic, and I can do it without looking. And that came in very handy in that situation because she was slipping off towards the edge. And that, again, taught me a very valuable lesson of the importance of knot tying. But if you're in an off-grid or a country uh, living setting, <clears throat> maybe you, maybe ladies, you know, you, how many of you have hauled stuff on a, a trailer, like brush, something like that, a load of fence posts, or what have you, and you don't have a ratchet strap? Now, ratchet straps have made dummies out of all of us because you can tighten down a load really easy. You just hook it on one side, hook it on the other, and you pump the ratchet until the, the load is tight. And those are very handy and they're very good, but what if it breaks? Do we know how to tie knots in such a way that I can wrench down a load, it is not going to come undone, and a, even a little woman like me can tighten a heavy load with the proper knots in such a way that it's safe, okay? Because you get an, an unsafe load and somebody's gonna get hurt, okay? We had a friend not too long ago <clears throat> that a bundle of, um, um, 
barn post. He was building a barn. A bundle of barn posts came undone and fell on him, and it broke his leg. So it's very important to know how to tie these things. I have a couple of cards, and I'll pass one around. You can look at these. These are, these are mine, but you can find them online. These are very good resources to have for just some basic knots. You can just flip through. They're on both sides. You can look through these and kind of get an idea of some of the knots that we're talking about. And if you want to get more serious about it, there's all kinds of really good resources that, I mean, you can, you can learn how to tie dozens and dozens of knots. But in our opinion, if you know six knots well, that's usually sufficient. We're only going to teach you probably two, maybe three, if we have time today. And before we begin, I'm going to, uh, where's the, is the blue rope outside? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to teach you, it may be a little bit hard to see with this um, small piece of cordage here, but, hmm? yeah, that's a good idea. <coughs> Pink rope is easier to see. Okay, let's go over just a little bit of terminology first, and I'm, uh, the only reason that I'm going to really go into any terminology at all is because it's going to make it a lot easier for all of us to communicate and do the same thing at the same time. When I'm working with a piece of rope, let's just pretend this is tied to my finger or post or whatever over here. That is the standing end. That's the standing end. The end that I'm working with to tie a knot is the working end. So you have standing end and you have working end. Okay? That's important to remember. I want to know which end of the rope I'm on. Standing in or am I on the working end? Okay? Standing in or working in. You can write that up there if you want to. Then the next term that I want to mention is a loop. Now there's all kinds of different types of knots. We'll get into that in just a minute. And they have different purposes. But a loop is when the rope crosses itself. That's a loop, okay? This may sound simplistic, but it really makes a difference when you're teaching people how to tie knots. Anybody in here know how to tie some knots? Good, okay. What kind of knots do you know? Okay. Does anybody know how to tie a bowling knot or a trucker's hitch? Excellent. Okay, those are the two we chose. Yes. What is a shoelace knot? That's the only one I know. <laughs> That's a good one to know. But <laughs> I don't know. I guess you call it a shoelace knot. I don't. Everybody knows it. Okay, so that's a loop. Whenever the rope crosses over itself, a bite is when you just have you take a bend in the in the rope, but it doesn't cross itself. That's a bite. B i g h t. So you have standing in, working in, loop, and bite, okay? Standing in, working in, loop, and bite, okay? Now, there's all kinds of different hitches, there's lashes, there's loops that you can tie into knots. The one that we chose, the two that we chose primarily to teach you today, and we'll teach you a third one if we all have time, because we want to get to fire starting too. Um, is the bowling, which is, if you're going to learn one knot and kind of sound like you know knots a little bit, if you don't learn how to tie the bowling, everybody's going to know you're really not a knot tire, okay? <laughs> Everybody needs to learn how to tie the bowling. Now, that was what this was supposed to be, okay? That's what this should have been, okay? But, I mean, we tease each other. We really tease each other about this. But anyway, a bowling is a fixed, non-slippable loop in the end of a rope. You can tie it in the center of a rope, but you tie it a little differently. For our purposes, we're going to work on the end, on the working end, okay? Now, why would I need that? In the situation with my friend, I needed it to fix a loop to her bumper that I could easily untie that it could be under a load, but I could still get it untied and I wouldn't have to cut my rope, okay? Um, if you're pulling someone out, that's a good situation. Um, 
If you're using a, on the end of a ridge line, setting up a tent ridge line, that's a good situation. So there's many, many different applications for the bowling. There's a way that you can tie it one-handed. Let's say I have fallen in the ditch and my husband throws me a rope. I can tie a bowling one-handed and put that around and he can pull me out. But, you know, if this arm is injured or I have to hang on for dear life with this hand to the rope and tie with the other, then once he pulls me out, we can easily get that knot undone, okay? So it's going to be a loop in a rope that can bear pressure and be easily untied, okay? It's a very important knot to know. My husband is going to teach you that one. You need to learn how to tie it just free and also if you're going around something. It's, it's a little confusing when you, when you just tie it free, it's pretty easy to learn. But when you start going around something, it can get a little confusing. The trucker's hitch, we're going to, um, I'm not sure exactly what the best way is to do it so that everybody can see. We may just everybody have to come forward. Uh, but <clears throat> when, when I teach you the trucker's hitch, he's going to tie a bowlin for my standing in. And then I'm going to show you how to tie a trucker's hitch and you'll see just how tight I can get that. Okay? All right, so let's pair up. We need you in pairs, and I need somebody, maybe, young man, would you help me? Now, guys, the pink rope won't hurt you. It's okay if you want to use pink rope, but give one to every two people. So if, if you guys are going to be together, you have one rope, okay? The girls got pink. Okay. <laughs> okay, and then we have this one up here too. We can we can cut another piece to use. Or we have this piece over here. <coughs> so find a partner and pair off and we're gonna learn how to tie a bowlin first. I just want to make quick mention of something. Um we always want to try to minimize, I, I meant to mention this, so I'm going to go back to mention this. We always try to minimize the motion of something that's sharp, knife or an axe. So when you're sharpening, um, I like to do the knife in a stable position and move, move the sharpener rather than the knife. Okay, just less motion. Maybe that's not such a big deal with a knife, but with an axe, you tell me what's easier, to do this or for me to do this. It's going to be a lot easier for me to just move the sharpener rather than the whole axe. Okay, let's get back to our knots. I just wanted to address one thing. <coughs> You can leave it on. Somebody asked what kind of knife, uh, what kind of uh, rope, and it does really depend on what you're doing. This right here is an arborist rope for those who cut down trees and stuff like that. This is 9,000 pound test rope. And we have used this with these knots that we're showing you to pull down that one tree at my mom's that we pulled down, I think was like two and a half feet across at the base. 34 inches. 34 inches. And we, we got it tied up way up high, and because of where it was located, we had to pull the tree as we cut it, and this rope was up to the task with ease. And you'll see it stretching and everything, but it's not gonna break, 9,000 pounds test. This is not a cheap rope. A friend of ours gifted this to us, and it has been one of our most prized possessions. All right, we ready? Um, for actually, for this part, we probably could, each of one of you could have a, but anyway, you're going to have to share. What we'll do <laughs> is take, what end is this? This is the working end. Okay. We're going to hold the standing end. Yeah. Another good reason for this while we're teaching this is because that's what we use to tie down our tent with. 
We'll do a bowling on the tent side down by the stake. We'll do the trucker's hitch. We'll take the, the working end. You're going to make a loop. But make sure when you make your loop that the working end is over the top of your standing end. Okay? This part of your rope should be over the top of this when you make your loop. Do you understand that? You can keep this up. Leave a little length. Now, whatever you're tying it to, you're going to wrap it around. Now, this is the little uh, ditty, I guess, if you want to call it that, to help me what they have told. I've heard other people describe how to do this. This is your working end, and they call it the rabbit. The rabbit is going to come up the hole, up the hole. So we're coming up. It comes out of the hole, and it's going to go down and around the tree on the back side of your standing end. And then it's going to come back up and down the hole again. And that is your bolens. I will do it again. That is your bolens. We'll do it again. Okay, take the working end, the standing end, and make a loop. And your working end of the rope has to be over the top of your standing end. And whatever you're tying it to, you're going to bring it around, whether it's through a loop on your tent, or if it's around a tree, or a bumper, or whatever it is, you're going to bring it around that object, you're going to bring it, the rabbit comes up the hole, up the hole. Then the rabbit is going to go behind the tree, down and behind the tree. And then he's going to come back up and into the hole, back down into his hole again. And then you pull the knot tight. And that is your bowling. So we have some in the group who have it mastered. So raise your hand again if you have it mastered, if you feel very confident. Okay, everybody look around. Make sure you have it. Okay, these are some of your go-to people when you forget it <laughs> to go back to. Okay, we need to move along because we do want to get to a little bit of fire starting stuff. Okay, but now what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to show you the trucker's hitch. And I'm not sure exactly how to do that, except now we didn't show you everything that we needed to about the bowling, but we showed you enough that you at least know how to tie the knot. It's a little bit different when you're tying it to something. Okay, I'm going to have my husband be my, my mannequin here. Um, let's do this, honey. You hold this. Yeah, hold it like that. There you go. Okay, now... I am going to need somebody to hold this very stable for me, okay? Maybe put your feet on the bottom or something like that because I'm going to show you just how strong this knot is. Okay, I have on my standing in back here, I have a bowline tied to the podium so that I can get it untied. That's my standing in. This is my working end, okay? I'm going to go around my object, and then on, on the side that's the working end, I'm going to make a loop, okay, and then I'm going to pull through a bite. You see why these terms are important? Okay, so again, if you need to come closer, you're welcome to. I'm going to make a loop, and I'm going to pull through a bite. I'm not sure how to do it with that. Let me stand back here on this side. Okay, can you hold this so that it stays up? The rope right here? Yeah. Okay, this is better for me anyway because this is the way I usually tie it. I'm going to make a loop, and usually I just twist it away from me. Okay? 
And then here on my working end, I'm going to make a bite and I'm going to put that through the bottom and pull it back. That makes a couple of, of non-binding, non-tightening loops. If you make an accident and you pull through from the standing end, this knot will collapse on you. I'll show you what I mean. If you pull it through from this way and you try to tighten it, whoops. If you try to pull your bite through from this way, this is going to collapse when you try to tighten it. And this will, this will, it's not that you don't want that. You want this loop to stay as a, a loop. So the, the way to do that, make a loop in your, in your rope and then from the working end, make a bite and put it up through that loop and, and that will not collapse. I'll show you what I mean. Come a little closer there. Whenever you, you're going to bring your rope around your object, and this you've made like a ratchet point, a pulley. You see how that stays whole? Yes. <coughs> okay, those of you who are standing here, can you come around? It's okay if you're in the camera, if you don't mind being on YouTube. You're welcome to come around. Brother John, everybody's wanting you to move over here, if you could. Okay, now... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of let you see what kind of power I can put on this, okay? You're going to have to come just a little closer, right there. Okay, make a loop, and you're going to have to come, kind of come up on your, your rope here. Make a loop, and then I usually pull the bite through the bottom of the knot of the loop, and I'm going to hold that. I'm going to come back and get my working end, and I'm going to bring it through this loop that I just made. Watch this. <laughs> this this will make you look like a boss. This knot will make you look like a boss. So it, there's a lot of power to that, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So you make a loop. You pull a bite up through the bottom, like so. Depends which way you turn that loop. And it does matter which way you turn the loop. I turn away from me, and I pull the bite up through the bottom. Okay? All right. And then I'm going to go, and I'm going to grab the end. He's getting ready now. <laughs> so, you can see that if, if I have a big load of posts or something and I have this blue rope, and I've done this with this blue rope, and I tie down these posts, I can really get it tight, really put a lot of pressure on that. So this, the, I love this knot. I could have probably pulled Debbie up the hill with this knot because you have all of this pulley system going on and it, it like quadruples your strength. So ladies, learn this knot, okay? So I twist, make a loop, turning away from me so that the working end is on top of the standing end. I bring a bite up through the bottom of that loop, and I'm going to hold that. I'm going to come back and get my working end and put it through that loop that I just made. <laughs> Show how you tight, cinch it. Okay, then you have, to, you have to fasten this. So what I like to do is what's called a half hitch on a bite. A half hitch on a bite, and it's super easy. You just come around the bottom, make a bite like so. You're holding this here. You come around through the bottom and bring it right through there, and that is not going anywhere. You guys hold this tight, but let me show you how easy this is to untie. When I'm ready to go, I'm done. Okay? So it is fun and it is very useful to learn to tie these knots. Okay, so let's practice the trucker's hitch, okay? Okay, I'll show you. We, and we can go around and show you this. I'll show, he wants me to show you the half hitch again. Okay, a loop, a bite, you come up through, tighten it down, and then you tie a half hitch. I hold it here, bring my 
my rope under and make a bite at the same time, and then I tuck that bite into here where I just made a little loop and just pull that tight. It's very tight, very useful knot, okay? And again, when you're ready to go, you're done, okay? Yeah, I think those are like less than 10 bucks on eBay or Amazon or something. Um, but I would, I would probably get a book because, you know, for five or 10 more dollars, you can have an entire book. But at any rate, you're welcome to, to keep the ropes a little longer in practice. But because we use these for teaching classes, I need to get all of those little ropes back. But we're going to move into the fire starting section. Now I'm going to let my husband start. Okay, we get the ropes back. Because of the shortage of time, um, we're just going to grab our charred cloth and our equipment and we're going to head outside. Um, this morning when Dana and I were on the way here, we stopped at uh, some cedar trees and you can peel this stuff off the, the bark on the cedar trees and it makes great bird's nests. Does everybody know what a bird's nest is? Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. So it's that's, a, it's, a tinder it's a tinder bundle and that's what, what you're going to make to get your fire started. That's not what we're going to start initially to get our flame with we're going to use what we like to use is charred cloth now you can get your charred cloth as I mentioned before from denim jeans we've got some scrap pieces here um, just simply cut them in little squares like we've done and put them we've got several tins but you put these in tins fill this up start a fire now these tins are loose enough their seals are loose enough that you won't have to drill a hole but some of them it's probably wise just to make a small hole eighth of an inch or smaller and you when you fill this tin up you stick it in the fire and you let it burn you're going to watch the smoke the smoke's going to keep coming out once the smoke stops you can wait a minute or two then take this out of the fire but do not open it because if you open it what's going to happen they're going to ignite and it's going to burn. Your charred cloth is going to be wasted. Take it out of the fire and let it cool. Okay. Once it's cooled, then you're going to have this. That's what it's going to look like. And you can do the same thing with what's called punk wood. And that's what this is. This is punk wood. We showed you what punk wood was. If you haven't seen it right here, it's soft wood, soft simply wood soft wood. It just breaks apart. Just break it apart, put it in the tin. It's made the same way as a charred cloth. Put the cover on the top, stick it in the fire till the smoke stops, take it out, let it cool. So this is, either one of these works great. They take a spark real quick. And so we're going to demonstrate it a couple different ways. Um, this is called, what? Flint and steel. Flint and steel. Has anybody used flint and steel? This is flint rock. And this is just actually a piece of a file that we cut down to use as our striker. What we're going to do is put the charred cloth you set it on the edge now this might not be a good piece do we have any other flint in there? I'll try it on this but you'll set your charred cloth right to the edge of your flint stone okay now this is just like knot tying. It takes a little practice. It takes a lot of practice. <laughs> a lot of practice. <laughs> but what you want to do is strike the rock as hard and quickly as you can without forcing it into it, just catching the edge of it. I caught the spark. She caught the so. spark. That doesn't happen. But all it takes is a little spark from that. And once this catches, I'll let her go with it, you set it in your tinder bundle. And once you put it in your tinder bundle, don't, it's better to hold it above you because once that flame takes off, it's going to come up. You want to hold it up here to blow it so when the flame comes. Now, 
Of course, before you get to this point, you would set up your twigs, your sticks that you're going to build your fire with. This will ignite, so you're going to set it over here. So that's flint and steel. Um, before you get to that point, though, of course, you would take your, your kindling and you would set your, those down first for your fire. And always check what direction your wind is from. If your wind is from this direction, which way would you point your flame, your fire, I mean, your twigs? You're going to make it sort of a teepee. You're going to leave it open on the direction. If the wind is from this way, leave it open on this end. You need oxygen. And so you're going to put your, your, uh, your twigs, your, kin tin tin or your kindling down first, and then your bigger branches on top. So once this fire bundle ignites, you're going to set it underneath. And the air will flow through, your fire will get going. But we're going to show you um, another easier method using charred cheating. cloth. This one's really cheating. <laughs> We showed this one yesterday. Yeah. And this is a ferro rod. And so you'll just take the striker part of it, you hold it down, it's good to set it down on something, and just take it and push it towards one strike. You see that that charred cloth takes a spark very quickly. Again, you put it in, you fold it up, and you just blow on it. And then, yep. And this, uh, <coughs> this works the same basically as the charred cloth. That's what we used yesterday to light the rocket stove. But we want to look at another option because here in this area, you have a lot of lighter knot fatwood, a lot of it. And where do you find it? Does anybody know? Pine trees. Now, my wife made up some shavings, but we've got it here, and we'll show you what you can do if you don't have these shavings. But I'll show you how quickly this lighter knot takes a spark. So you can take these shavings. Now you're going to set these shavings in with your uh, kindling because you can throw a spark into here and these will ignite. They probably won't burn all that long so you get smaller pieces of the lighter knot and just cut it down into, into little twigs. These will burn quite a long time. You'll get your fire started. I bet you this would burn at least 10 minutes, probably. And so you can just lay them around. That's a little toy candy. There's another way that you can do that. Um, if you don't have a, that big of a knife, you can use even a smaller knife and you can make what's called a feather stick or just feathers with it, <coughs> kind of like what I was doing there. You see how I'm leaving these actually on here? If I had a, a smaller stick of this, which we do. So, so you say you like that, you like the whole stick? Yeah, I'm going to throw some sparks on here. But this here whole stick, but you want to use a smaller one yeah, now. Yeah, this is not a good okay. piece. You would just keep feathering the shavings down to the end and then you would use that end because that end will uh, light better, of course, when it's spread out and the smaller it is. Isn't there another word for that? So you see, that's the concept. Resin? Light or not? Has everybody seen that? Fatwood. There's fatwood. Okay. Fat lighter. I've heard it called different things, yeah. So let's let's take a look at this uh, pine resin. Light 
up nice. It smells great too. That caught a spark. The nice thing about using the, the kindling like this is it, like he said, it, it will burn a while. And if your sticks are a little wet, it's going to help you get a fire a lot faster. And this with all the resin in there, it's going to burn long enough that even if you hear woods a little bit wet, it still should light. What did you call that? This? This is a ferro rod. Where does it come from? Where do you buy it? Oh. You can buy them online. There's, there's different... Um, this is my favorite one. Yeah, you can order them online, sporting goods stores. They have all different size. Now, you can explain that one. Yeah, this one, this is actually magnesium. And uh, I'll just use this knife for it. And if you, if you watch, you can shave off some of these little pieces. It hurts my heart to do this. Just careful not to get too close to there. That's going to... But you can shave that off and that'll take a, a spark. Yeah. So instead of using this, you can use the magnesium rod, scrape, scrape it off. It burns at very high heat. I can't remember if it's 3,000 degrees. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So you can use that. Um, as you can see, this stuff burns a long time. Now the to strike these ferro rods, this is a little piece of um, hacksaw blade. You can use that. You can use the, uh, this is where I mentioned earlier, these Mora knives don't have a 90 degree spine, most of them. So they won't really throw good, well that was making a liar out of me, but you can with some of them I guess. My green one here, I was never able to get it to strike, but with my PTS knife, It really, it really throws out the sparks. So once you've got techniques and methods, fire starting and little practice, it it's not that hard. These are the cotton balls I was telling you about. They're pretty dry, but I've thrown sparks onto them. They still light. Again, don't put cotton balls of Vaseline into a leather pouch <laughs> because the leather's going to absorb it, but they still work. And these will actually burn a couple minutes, three minutes, depending how much Vaseline you have in them. Um, so the magnesium, we did the fat wood, the charred cloth, um, punk wood. Punk wood. We've same as a charred cloth. It just takes a spark. Um, yeah, you made. Did you show them how to make that bird's nest out of that? I kind of did while you were talking. You you can see. Um, you just sort of have to to rough it up a little bit. A friend of mine told me one time she was going to rough me up a little. So this is what she meant, I guess. I'm gonna rough you up. So. She was going to do this to me. <laughs> you just break it up. And you'll have some pieces that will fall out that you can still use, but you want to break up those fibers. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, one thing I will say, when you're, when you're looking for tinder out in the wild, mm -hmm. the cedar tree is your friend. And if it's been raining, look on one side of the tree and start noticing things like this. When you go out after it's rained, a lot of times My one side of the tree is wet and the opposite side of the tree is dry. So if you find a standing dead tree that you can get punk wood out of on the dry side, or if you find an eastern red cedar or something here, you can get this outer bark and just peel it off and rough it up like that and just make it so that it's kind of fine. Like I did this one. We could pass this around if y'all want to look at that. And you know, just get out and look for different things. The other day when we started a fire, I just took old dried grass from last year that was still standing off the ground. Broom sage. Broom sage. And I just took the same thing and roughed it up and made a bird's nest out of that. Just and look for worked. anything that's dry. Um, dead standing trees is your best bet for finding yeah, those and, kind of materials. And here around these parts, the, the lighter knot or fatwood. 
or kindling, some people call it. Now, brother Kelly, you build, this always works. Build when you do that first. You want to build a little stack, and then underneath of it, have you did. Yeah, we once would. the fire starts, you know what I mean. You want to be sticking nothing in there, so that all that fire does just keep coming up, coming up. Right. Coming That's up, right. And that's what Brother Marvin was saying, and I think all of us understand. You start with the smaller twigs, your kindling first, and you build it up to bigger. And this is the tinder that would go underneath it. That's why we leave it open, so we can get that tinder underneath it once it's lit. And we want oxygen. Fire needs heat, um, oxygen, and fuel. So we want to make sure all three of those things are supplied. Um, any questions? F-E-R-R-O, I think, Faro. And you can see, I don't know how long this has been burning, but those little slivers of this... Well over five minutes. Yeah, it's been burning quite a while, so you should get a fire started out of that. You can do something wrong. Yeah. yeah. Five minutes. <laughs> yeah. And if you, you see how fast those saying, feathers... You have all of it built around yeah. you, so yeah. you got to go look at another. Right. Exactly it. Yeah. And this stuff ignites even when it's wet. Mm -hmm. the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very good resource. Well, where do you see this fatwood, right? I mean, they're pine trees. Everywhere. If we walked yeah. so probably not 100 yards from here, there's a stump of it. Dead pine trees fell yeah. down. If you see a dead standing uh, pine tree stump, you know, just maybe yay tall, and it's all rotted looking around the top, if you'll tear that away, down in the center and around the root is what you'll find. This, this is what you'll find. And you'll know when you got to it because you'll have a small or strong uh, odor of pine, pine saw. It smells like pine saw. It looks like it's got like pine blue all over it, thick and rich. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We used to call that term time, I think it was. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 That's a great material. Yeah. All right, that's a quick lesson on fire starting. Um, we didn't have much time. It would have been nice if all of us could have got to build a bird's yeah. nest and but spark the charred cloth. Don't ever one of these. Yeah. I, I, I made one. Well, I'll tell you yeah, you good made job. one. Very good. Good one job. Things, right? You made a Here's baby bird's nest. children with a lighter that is worried that you know, they might burn bird themselves. Bird yeah. yeah. And I make uh, USB chargeable lighters. So mm. There's no flame, it just makes a little spark. Mm -hmm. You just plug it into any USB. Like and it, it, it'll light probably a good 20 times before you need to recharge it. Mm. Interesting. Mm. They're like 10 bucks on Amazon. Oh. I figure it's good, you know, if you have like a little solar charger. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're out camping, you can charge it. Mm -hmm. Then use it, and it, it, it lights up pretty quick. Mm -hmm. so a little piece of paper in there. I'm making light. a bird. Yeah. <laughs> good job, buddy. And there are other methods to starting fires. I, like I mentioned, the magnifying glass, I didn't bring it today for obvious reasons, but um, it does work. I use a conventional method, which is pour gasoline. Just light it yeah. up. <laughs> Not a good idea. Is that a good idea? <laughs> that ain't a good no, idea. No. I'm wearing the scars on that. Yeah. No. Oh, man, that was, that was a deal. Okay. Yeah, the thing is, gasoline will follow you. you that's know? what happens. Yes. Yeah, it'll follow you. It will. Like this. That thing trailed it. Yeah. I can't in my head. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I got it out of there just enough, but not far enough for it. Because in such a short time, it's really hard um, to get everybody involved. And so, really. You really need time for, to work yeah. on the skills.